we can take it from there. Sure. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, so, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Joe Schumann. I'm the founder of Divided We Fall, which is a nonprofit news publication dedicated to re uh, reinvigorating civil discourse and debate by promoting engagement between people who disagree. Um, and we're here with Mark Sargent, who is one of the leaders of the Flat Earth Movement um, and recently featured on the Netflix documentary Behind the Curve. Um, and he's gone off. For nope, a moment. nope, nope. I was carrying the microphone. Back. You're totally good. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's back. The man who needs no introduction. Um, <laughs> but to kind of set the stage, um, just and in the spirit of kind of full disclosure, Mark and I do not agree on whether the earth is flat. Um, and so maybe we'll dabble into that in the end. But really why we're here is to discuss disagreement. Sure. Um, so anyone who's familiar with the flat earth movement knows it's a very controversial topic. Um, it often uh, starts some very heated debates. Um, and so we're here to kind of have the meta debate about how do you even engage with someone who you fundamentally disagree with? Right. Um, so, Mark, I guess I would start off by asking, um, is my characterization of the flat earth debate correct? Is it is it really something that gets kind of heated and, and personal? <laughs> Are you serious? It is, <laughs> it is the most polarizing thing I've ever seen ever. And not to bring up too many topics, but take your pick. I don't care. I would put flat earth against anything out there, whether it's, uh, oh, I don't know, insert this group's rights here. Uh, gay rights, women's rights, black rights, uh, uh, Jewish rights, uh, stem cell research, abortion. Take your pick. Flat earth. I've never seen anything generate such a knee-jerk response as this topic does and it does it for a very particular reason and that is it's the only conspiracy if you want to use the word we use all sorts of different words but it's the only conspiracy we debunk to children we don't we don't talk to six-year-olds about human rights or stem cells or abortion or anything like that but we do put a globe in their classroom and so and, and it's really subliminal how it happens to where all of a sudden you gotta remember that when, when you're six years old if it's in your classroom usually right next to the american flag uh by the time you get through high school let's say you don't go to college uh you probably time to get through high school that's 12 years of a globe sitting in your classroom well also next to the american flag and people are willing to fight for the american flag almost no difference between that and the globe because you're told mm -hmm. this so many years it's like oh yeah this is where you live this is where you live and then all of a sudden somebody comes up and says oh yeah it's not where you live interesting i think for me uh, something i've been thinking about is you know because we're a, a blog that mostly does political debate right um I, in my mind this is in some ways a scientific debate um so that's kind of why and in the same way that debates about climate change get very heated because it's like you know we have this the science on our side right. and right. then people who oppose uh, who don't believe in climate change say that that's not true. Like scientific debates, if you want to kind of classify a group of debates, seem to really draw out kind of anger between sides. But yeah, yeah, potentially. Uh, but that's an interesting point you brought, brought up in that, yeah, it should be a science debate. But most of the time that the battles that you see being fought in the, in the flat earth battlefields are f between people that have no stake in science whatsoever so why are they why are they so heated about it uh and i think i can sum it up with the, this guy that called into a radio show that i was on a couple of years ago now where he was this older guy and he said yeah his father worked for nasa blah 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 and am i calling him a liar and we got past that and then he stopped he goes he goes how dare you he goes how dare you young man which was weird because i'm 50 uh tell me tell me the world isn't what i think it is how dare you and it's true. Uh, out of all the conspiracies, let, let me just sum it up with this. I know I ramble a little bit. But every other conspiracy you can think of, I'm not going to rattle them off necessarily, you can bury in the desert. You don't have to look at it. If you don't want to look at just fill in the blank conspiracy here, you don't have to look at it. Flat Earth is the only one which is really, really tough to just walk away from. You've got to resolve it one way or the other. Either you just choose, it's like, you know what? Scientists know better and I don't have to listen to these guys. Or you're on the other side where you're all of a sudden you go down this tunnel and you come out the end and you're enlightened. So, yeah, sorry. That's a, no, that's an interesting point. I think y your point about the person who called into the radio show, I think when people get angry in a debate, it's yeah. often because part of their identity is challenged. Yes. I think that's, you know, religious identity. Uh, if you're secular, your scientific identity, I think because you start feeling like the debate is about you and your right. value. Um, and I think that generally turns it up a notch. What you know what I kind of I've, I've had some time over again. I've been doing this four years now, 
uh, which seems like not a long time, but if you're if you're in the community, it's a really really long time because a lot of stuff <laughs> happens in here. But I'm trying to come up with different analogies, and the the closest one I had was because people say, why do people get so, just so worked up over this? Why I mean, get really really heated, not to the point of violence. You know, we've had hundreds of regional meetups and. Uh, conferences in different countries. We've never had an incident ever. No, nobody's yeah. ever done anything, which is for either side. We, it's not like, well, part of it's because nerds, you know, don't swing baseball bats and have fresh tattoos, <laughs> right? They, they don't. You're not going to see a bunch of thugs walking into, you know, a conference center at the Marriott. You know, it's like, <laughs> let me tell you about gravity. I'm going to start cracking skulls. Um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like telling somebody, I don't know how old you are, but uh, telling someone, let's say when they're 30, that they're adopted. Just somebody out of the blue, not your parents, just somebody, your friend, right? Some Somebody you know. It's like, dude, I think you're adopted, right? And and you're just like, whatever. And you just blow them off, right? right? And it doesn't mean anything to you. It does not change your life until the split second that you give it even an, a shred of credibility. And then all of a sudden, it's like ripples going back in time. Remember that globe in the classroom at six-year-old? Uh, if you all of a sudden, it's like, wait, wait. Even for a split second, you think, maybe I was adopted. All of a sudden, you're scanning every memory going back as far as you can. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where? My parents, they were always the same people, right? It's like I wasn't left on a basket, you know, in, in somewhere, somebody's doorstep. Uh, yeah. But it, yeah, it freaks them out. It, it's because it, it goes back in time. It's, it's, it's a strange thing to tell people. Again, because yeah. of what you were saying, it challenges their world. Their, their very existence around them. It is the, we use it too, probably too often, which is the whole red pill, blue pill matrix thing. Like when Neo was told, and, and it was an interesting quote, and I was really surprised that, that it was written into the, to the movie, which something that Morpheus said, he goes, we don't free a mind after a certain age because they can't take it. You know, you have to hit them when they're, when they're younger. And otherwise, it's just, it's too jarring, which is, of course, why if you want to get into the U.gov survey, we can. As you go down downwards into the younger demographics, our uh, our success rate goes up a lot, mm. which is why that's interesting. Yeah, to where like the 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 lowest the lowest one you can do a census on is the eighteen to twenty four year olds, and the U.gov did a survey. You know, they're a British research team, and they they were just bored one day apparently and said, "Let's poll of ten thousand Americans," and the eighteen to twenty four year olds, uh, a third of them, weren't buying the Globe anymore. And I was like, really? That, and that freaked out a lot of scientists. I mean, like National Geographic and a bunch of science journals to where the, all of a sudden you started seeing articles coming out saying, well, it's obvious U.gov was wrong. <laughs> it's obvious mm -hmm. they, they screwed it. It's like, what? It's your guys. <laughs> it's not us. You, we didn't ask them to do the survey. You told them to do the survey. And now you're saying, well, that you're obviously doing it wrong because the numbers don't add up. It's like, no, it's just that, that people are more pliable at a younger age. Sorry, I ran mm -hmm. No, I, that's great. I, I, the pun is very much intended here, but I think the phrase earth shattering. Oh, could, could apply. yeah, it's good. That's good. Uh, yeah. So uh, kind of changing topics slightly. Um, mm -hmm. I think something I really appreciated from the documentary is that you seem to be someone who is, you know, very firmly on one side of this debate, right. but that is, is not unwilling to talk to people who disagree with you. Um, you seem actually pretty interested. So I'm kind of curious about uh, how often you do that and kind of why you, you find yourself doing that? Uh, mostly because, all right, well, if, part of it is because of the training that I had growing up, which was when I did my career, I was doing high-level software resolution, a lot of, a lot of technical troubleshooting, uh, high-level clients. Uh, basically, if you had, if you got to the, the highest level in, uh, in stress, <laughs> like your company paid ridiculously amounts of money for software that was not working for them. Uh, if things got really, really bad and, and you were like one step away from calling the lawyers, you eventually had to talk to me. And so I was kind of force uh, trial by fire, uh, a lot of different ways of, of um, empathy more than anything. And that's probably, if you want to, you want the overriding theme of this, of what you and I are talking about here, it's empathy which is you have to put yourself in their shoes, which is, and, and, and that kind of leads into, and, and because I, you had to feel their pain. If you don't feel their pain, you're not going to be able to relate to them. And so when it came to flat earth, what I try to tell people and, and people have used this quote many, many times, which is, look, I can't yell at them because that would be hypocritical. I was them. 
I was on the other side of the fence and everyone in Flat Earth forgets this. At some point, it's really, really a weird transformation where everybody starts out in Flat Earth hating it. It's absolutely in the negative. Nobody, nobody just jumps on the train as it's moving by. It's like, Flat Earth, yeah, bandwagon, let's do this. Everybody hates it. Everybody tries to disprove it. Uh, the um, the t-shirt literally reads, I became a Flat Earther because I tried to debunk it or disprove it or whatever. Uh, same thing with me. I, four, uh, four and a half years ago now, uh, I sat down and I said, I'm just going to shut this thing down. You know, I've, I've looked at every other conspiracy. You, I mean, you watch the documentary, you, you know this part of the story, which is I, I, I knew every other conspiracy. I haven't looked at this one. It's on my bucket list. I'm getting older. Let's just let's just say I can I can actually have an opinion on it. And it was the worst thing ever. I got into it. And I was going, oh, no, 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 no. Can't be, can't be. And everybody does the same thing. It's like there's no way there could be any credibility to this. And so when people come at me and, and yell and scream, I mean, the YouTube comment section is just brutal. I mean, anyone <laughs> that, that's true for everyone, I think well, yeah, it is. It is. I, it was a joke I've made several times, which is, you know, the old saying, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. That that's not the saying I use anymore. I, the saying is, if you can't say something nice, you're probably in the YouTube forums because <laughs> yeah. it's just a nightmare. Anyone that starts a YouTube channel, if they if they enjoy their self-esteem at all, do not read your comments. Because there are people in there. It doesn't matter how shiny, wonderful video you make. It doesn't make any difference. Seriously, I, I kid you not. You could make a video about a kitten chasing a puppy through a meadow and a butterfly overhead. You caught it all on camera and it's flat. It's beautiful. It's the most, a tear comes to your eye. You put it on YouTube and within a hundred hits, you're you know, I, in fact, I've never seen anyone go like 300 thumbs up and no thumbs down. By, by the time you get about 100, somebody's going to walk in there going, this is effing gay. Thumbs down, write a comment. This is gay. You know, unsub. I hate all of you. It's like they've got so much hate. You know, the, the Taylor Swift line. You know, haters going to hate, 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 hate. <laughs> it's true. They never stop. They've got painful childhoods and they just lash out it. And it's, and it's awful to watch. So I think I mean your comment on empathy is something I think about a lot in the in the context of online communication and debate. Like these people don't know the person who posted it. Right. They don't know what they're trying to do. They have zero empathy. I mean, we're like just words on a screen interacting with each other online. And that's why I feel like all online I, I, I am someone obviously who cares a lot about debate and disagreement, but I'm right. a skeptic in terms of whether we can ever have productive debate wholly online. It's you're absolutely right. I've had well, because look, I'm older than you. I was there when the first forums came out, way before YouTube, way before Reddit, and you. I was there, and it was and it was there that that particular type of not, not to be a downer, but that particular type of argument and lashing out was there literally since day one. And it was mostly younger men, which I was there too. But, but I mean, I, again, because of the industry I was in, I, I wasn't in that road, which was, they said, um, they, they all of a sudden, you imagine being a young man, right? With, with a painful childhood or just, they were sudden happy in general. And all of a sudden they're given a voice, but it's anonymous voice. That's the key here, mm -hmm. which is, wait, wait, I can say anything I want and no one will know it's me. And all of a sudden you can, you can hear them just winding up, cracking their knuckles going, all right, I've got 10 years worth of angst. I'm going to throw out on the internet starting with you. And, yeah. and, and they just, yeah, they just attack and it, it never, it never got better. I wish, and I know part of me thinks, well, you know, if you had an inter the, the anonymity, you know, if you got an internet registration system, but then you're talking about a whole nother darkness, you know, you don't want to do that. Um, uh, so let me ask you this. Yeah. Um, I kind of the flip of the last question, uh, which is that, you know, I, I was kind of struck by how willing you were to go engage with other people. Sure. Do you find the opposite to be true? Do you find non flat earthers to be willing to engage with you? And I ask because when I told some of my friends that we were going to do an interview, um, some of them were actually kind of upset. Uh, and they thought, why they? I mean, they're sort of in the like no platform camp. Like, oh, if, if oh, yeah. Don't someone, don't you... talk to flat earthers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Um, so, is that the more typical response, or do you find that non flat earthers, some non flat earthers, are willing to kind of engage productively? And uh, just for my own kind of personal plug, what I told them was, I actually, you know, I'm not here to try and change your mind. Yeah. But if I were, I actually find civility to be the best way to do that. I, I think that like no one changes their mind when they're getting yelled at. 
people change their mind because someone who they trust and respect right. you know, plants a seed, and then over time, that seed might grow into something. It, it really varies, what you're asking there, yeah, the civil discourse, funny term. Uh, <laughs> it, it really varies because in the media, I mean, yeah, I've talked to a whole bunch of media at this point, and they're willing to talk about it, but most of the hosts have to take a stand, and the producers behind those hosts have to take the stance of, we don't want to alienate our audience. So they're in a weird, they're in a precarious position. And I don't really care if anyone's listening to this. I don't care about the hosts so much. I care about the people listening to the hosts because the people who are listening are a lot more pliable. The host has a stance and that's generally not going to waver. So they'll talk to me and it's kind of, but it's more like a fact finding mission than anything else. Like, okay, what do you believe? How'd you get into it? What, give me a few details. We're not going to spend too much time on this. And in fact, you can almost gauge their open mindedness on the time slot that they allow. So like I did a radio station yesterday, I think we talked 10 minutes, five, five minutes to give me the break breakdown, which is not a lot of time. And then five minutes worth of phone calls, which in fact, the segment was called change my mind. It was like the phone calls came in. It's like, okay. Um, so people, all right. So there's lots of people willing to talk about it, but if you initially have that knee jerk response and you brace against it, no, no, they don't want to talk about it. In fact, here, here's the perfect example of it. Um, the YouTube comments section, as you know, I've, I mean, I've got like 1500 videos out there and the, the comments are just brutal. They're horrible, horrible, horrible. <laughs> and yet remember in the description box of every single video I make at the very top, there's my email address, my phone number, my physical address, all this stuff. And yet almost none of these trolls or pe whoever it is, whoever's arguing, we won't call them necessarily trolls. They won't email me with any sort of hate. They won't, I'm sorry, phone keeps ringing. It's surprising. The, uh, um, they don't, they don't email me. So most of the emails I get are neutral or positive because people that are really, really angry for whatever reason, they don't, I mean, tr remember that the, the whole point of trolls is they remain anonymous. So they don't want to even bot. They're too lazy to even spoof an email to, you know, a fake email or just, I mean, how long does it take to create a fake Gmail account? Right. Or if worse yet, even phone call. I mean, 99.9% .9 of my phone calls are absolutely, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I want to hear more about this. I mean, yeah, every once in a while I get a drunk guy that will call, up, you know, three of them are <laughs> like, yeah, you flat earth, stupid dial tone. Eh. <laughs> you know, but but most of the time, yeah, it's the, the people won't come forward. And academics, oh, boy, if you've got a, I used to say master's degree or higher, but even a bachelor's degree in any sort of physical science, yeah, they do not reach out. Uh, at all because it's it's too burned in their heads they, they will not listen to us it, it's basically fr if it doesn't come from ma mainstream media it never happened mm. so yeah it's tough we like, we have a hard time talking with academics at all about this it's really tough most of the time though it's because they they consider it and i know they didn't talk about it much in the documentary they consider it beneath them to talk about mm -hmm. it. It's, it's like, why should I kind of like the platform thing where you're talking about? It's like, why should I even bother talking? They're obviously crazy. You know, my, my, uh, my master's degree, my PhD tells me, you know, it's basically, it's, it's a stamp of approval saying, I don't have to talk to these people. It's like, all right, fine. And I've warned them in speeches and different things that I've said, look, if you do not address this, which is what national, sorry, I go off on tears, uh, national geographic, when they did their piece last year, that was their their whole motivation was they realized that science was not addressing this uh, that you know other than neil degrasse tyson going on comedy central and dropping the microphone other than that no one has ever come forward to make any sort of organized defense against us and it's like all right you don't want to that's fine we will win by attrition before it's over so, sorry that was i mean that was one of my real takeaways from the documentary uh the section uh with where there was the flat earth meetup and then the sort of local science yeah astronomy right down the street meetup. yeah Th that i thought was a really powerful section um where you had you would flash back and forth between the two sides yeah. and some of the people at the uh, the astronomy meetup were saying like this is a group we have to engage and we have to get to know and, um personally and then let's debate this topic and, and that is thank you for mentioning that that is a that is it is wonderful words <laughs> Uh, however, it is way, it's easier said than done. So yeah, a lot of them will say that. It's like, oh wait, we, we really need to engage. How about you engage? Oh no, no, I'm not going to be engaging. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? You just said we should engage. But if you ask them, Hey, who's going to step forward and do it? Nobody volunteers. And it's like, all right, 
again, it's it's it, we we've given them every chance to to warn. It's like, look, the masses out there, the people in the street, they are not science based, as you know. I they, hell, a lot of them don't even know geography or or anything about the the political landscape or anything. I mean, you've seen you know all the jokes, for example. Um, not to say they're dumb. I, I don't want to call the public dumb. Uh, but when like Jay Leno used to go out or Conan O'Brien, you know, the man on the street, let's ask people on the street, simple, simple questions. Right. And they don't yeah, know yeah. it. I mean, Mark Dice made a freaking career out of it, you know, just humiliating people on the street. So it, that being said, and, and this is something I, I have to bring up if the average person, I feel bad because the science doesn't know once you reach a certain level of science, you don't know how to, I don't want to use the word dumb it down. But you don't you have no way of boiling it down to where the people in the street understand. And by that, I mean, the average person on the street doesn't know even if I explain to him the curvature of the Earth formula, which is eight inches per mile squared. The second I say squared, they just glaze over. They, they, it's like everything you remembered about high school algebra, it's gone. You, you've forgotten all that stuff because most people hate math. And so when science comes forward and they say, oh, yeah, we're going to beat you with math, it's like, no, no, that's the worst idea I've ever heard because people don't understand math. So you, you, what you're talking to them, you might as well be speaking Latin. They, they do not know it. Uh, sorry, let me end on this point, which is uh, what I say is the, the population I don't think is dumbed down. They've just been fed this steady diet of junk food media to where, and I've heard this so many times from people. It's like, we don't want to learn. We want to be entertained. It's like, yeah, but eventually you got to learn something because if it's all entertainment, then then what do you got? I mean, you, you really have nothing. I mean, it's like, you know, eating the entire chip aisle with Frito-Lay products. It's like at the end, it's like, what, what'd you get out of it? Almost nothing nutrition. Why? Yeah. So sorry, well, I'll tell you, so I, I uh, was an engineer as an undergrad and I considered myself kind of part of the scientific community. Perfect. And I mean, I... I we, I think we agree here. Scientific literacy is something that's crucially important. And, uh, you know, you, you use the phrase dumbing down and I'd probably, you know, call it like communication sure. um, between experts and, and the public. And I totally agree. I think that's something that's needed uh, to, to the kind of the earlier point about the dueling meetups. Right, um, right, right. My thought when watching that section was um, you can you can approach debate in two ways. One, you can think of civility as like an end in and of itself and a, like good intrinsically, right. uh, which is what I do. And if you believe that, then you would engage with someone you fundamentally disagree with for no other reason. Right. I don't expect most people to believe that. What I think most people would think is we should use civility as a way to convince someone. But I think that is also legitimate. Um, and so for the, for the scientific community that doesn't want to engage with flat earth, that's what I would say to them. Like, if you truly believe the earth is not flat, then what you need to do is engage with people who you disagree with and do it constructively and that's your best chance of convincing them. Exactly. But basically, I think disengagement should not be an option. It is uh, really my thought. Agreed. Uh, there was something that you reminded me of something just then where I've, I've told people often that what I think about, you know, because I've been doing this long enough, I basically look at it like a giant chessboard. And, and it's like, okay, what are the other, what are the people doing on the other side of the board? And, and it's tough for me because I have to look at media and politics and, and different celebrities that are talking about, you know, anyone that mentions Flat Earth, I have to see where they kind of fit on the chessboard. And I treat it like that. And what I what I try to tell people is like, look, you have to, again, the empathy thing, apply it to a, an opponent right, on the on the other side of the board. And that is the, the genius about chess is if you if you're good enough, you're, you got to get in their head. You have to be on the you have to see you, you can't just look at the pieces and say, OK, and look at it from the mechanics. It's like, OK, what's he trying to do? What's happening here? Why why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? And we're si and we do that all the time. We're constantly looking at the other side, saying, "Okay, why are they doing this?" We're looking at the subtle movements and and maybe ethereal things that are happening. Science won't even acknowledge that there is another side of the board. That's the part that bothers us. In, is that okay? You know, it's like we're playing a one sided game, and they aren't. They just aren't even addressing. It. It's like we're, we're there's the, there's not even a game happening. There's no board. There's no players. It's just us and these this rabble that are just making this noise. And it's like, yeah, but this rabble has been getting louder and bigger every year, and it's not going away. I mean, I've I've the videos. I remember I laughing. You know, when the first videos came, it's like, oh, flyer, it's over. The end of 2015. It's done. Rip. You know, R.I.P. Case closed. It's like, really? Because it's we're still here, and the conferences just keep getting more. I mean, I've got what do I? I've got seven conferences this year. I've got to go to. And only one of only two of them were in the United States. 
So wow. don't tell me that, that Flat Earth is, is going away because I talk to the people. I know the numbers. You know, I've watched this thing just get bigger and bigger. Uh, but yeah, it's sorry. It's it's it is very, very. Oh, here, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, the one there was one chance I had. To, well, I mean, yeah, I did an astrophysicist on a thing down in L.A., but he was also I think he's one of those guys that was actually trying to merge uh, Christianity and religion which is tough. That does not make him a very popular in either sect, the science science side or the religious side. And he debated against me. But there was an astrophysicist out of Georgetown who agreed and wasn't even my idea. It was a German television team. They said, we found a guy and what we'll do is we'll, we'll set it up really formal to where you record some science questions on a video. We'll record you on video. We will take that video, show it to him. He'll respond in video. That way you guys aren't talking directly. And it's, you know, it's very, very compartmentalized. It's like, great, fantastic. He goes, you start, come up with five questions. And I rattled off five quick questions. I shot it to him and that was it. He just folded. He just said, nope, not doing it. And this is okay, that's fine. But you just, you know, you ruined the chance of dialogue at that point. In fact, yeah. it couldn't have been more civil because we didn't even have to talk to each other directly. All we were doing is like watching videos of each other. So, and you had, you know, no, no time limit to respond. It was like, this is the perfect, the most low key debate you could ever have. And even that he, he wouldn't do. So, yeah, that's unfortunate. Mm. Um, so let me ask you this, yeah. um, uh, either on this debate or on something else, but I'd be interested specifically on this debate. Mm. Um, have you changed your mind on anything? And if so, what caused that? No, good Lord. No, in fact, it was, it's been the opposite. Um, when I started, I had the chance of of um, going the other way. I did. I mean, I put it out there. I was ninety nine percent sure that my arguments were were good enough, but which which is why I put it out to the internet. I mean, I was not shy about this. I said, "Look, I don't think I can solve this anymore." Because I used to. I mean, I'm not kidding. You, I used to collect antique globes. That's how far into the globe model I was. I mean, I I, mean, I was kind of weird. I collected bookends, and I'm older. So, but I collected antique globes, and when I put this, when, when I put the series of videos out there, I was literally waiting for the phone to ring, you know, the, the shoe to drop, and some academic called me up and say, "All right, here's where you screw it up." Blah blah blah. Case, you know, case closed. Shut it down. You can you can shut down your YouTube channel and go back to your normal life. And months went by, and the exact opposite happened. Where I mean, the media—that's one thing. But then the subject matter experts started calling me. I mean, members of all branches of the armed forces, and engineers, and pilots, and air traffic controllers, and uh, you name it—they were contacting me just unsolicited, saying, "You know what? You may be onto something here, and here's why." And so we—I'd interview them on my my radio thing, and we just started stacking those things up. So by the even by the time 2015 ended. No, no, the cement had pretty much hardened. Uh, but that being said, is there, because I imagine this would be the follow up question, is there, it, could I even think of anything that could change my mind now? Yeah, there's two things one really expensive and one not so expensive. Um, the, the expensive one would be, well, at least the first part of it's not expensive. You get a 4K camera, put it on the capsule of some rocket that's going to leave, you know, go, in fact, it, what, what? What the Israeli uh, program? Why didn't they put a you know? Why didn't the camera run from you know? Why don't they have a time lapse running from the Earth to the Moon? Remember they were supposed to be landing on the Moon today, if if you read the headlines, which is just mind blowing to me. And yet there was no 4K camera running you know from the launch pad. You know we have tons of memory nowadays, and 4K is easy. Um, where where the Earth falls below and turns into a globe. We've in the history of space travel, we've never had that footage. Statistically impossible some space program i don't you know some probe is going to you'd want that you'd want some time lapse of leaving the the space center below and then all of a sudden it turns into a globe and hey wonderful beautiful and then it turns into a small dot we never ever had that that'd be the the expensive way to do it uh the cheap way and it doesn't prove a flat earth no but it, it goes a long way to, to helping our cause uh would be my mark dies in a vacuum chamber challenge which is not not kidding which is like, okay, because uh, the spacesuit cannot work the way it works the, from because of the law of thermodynamics. Uh, uh, pressure needs a container, and the spacesuit should become like a basketball in a vacuum and burst. And it doesn't. So I said, okay, um, find me some sort of spacesuit. Remember, no spacesuit has ever failed in the history of, of astronauts, which is also weird, uh, ever. Not even close, uh, except for the one guy that said he almost drowned, but that's a whole other thing for another time. 
So find me an old spacesuit, put me in a vacuum chamber, uh, hopefully with a scientist that has his own spacesuit because I don't want to go in there alone necessarily, but if I will, if I have to, and then pull the switch and tell me, and I, I can bring in three items that prove it's a vacuum, uh, a bell, a glass of tap water, and a little balloon with a tiny amount of air in it. And that'll prove, you know, to me that it was a vacuum and nope, nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to touch it. No university wants to, wants to shut it up. So yeah, those are the two things that would change my mind. Again, does that prove, I'm sorry, the second part, does that prove that it's a, um, that it's a flat world? No, no, it doesn't, but it destroys everything because remember if the suit, if the suit can be proven false, if the suit can be proven a lie, then anything that's ever shown a suit is a lie. And that destroys Apollo, Gemini, Mercury, uh, the ISS, Soyuz, everything. And so in that point, it's like, okay, why are you lying up there? And then a whole bunch of questions. Sorry. Go ahead. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I want to, uh, I'll follow up on the time-lapse video. I'll, uh, Find I'm going to search around. Yeah, I, I have to feel, you know, like SpaceX just launched, you know, Elon launched his own uh, Tesla into orbit. Really? I'm, you want to I have wanna to talk, imagine that. You want to talk no, about that? No. Okay, let's we, talk about that real quick. <laughs> Okay. So the Tesla program, uh, I didn't know, you know, there was no advance notice for this thing. And all of a sudden I got a, I got a, an email sent to me with a, with a still shot of, you know, the car in space, you know, that, that, that perfect profile shot. And I immediately, it's like, Oh, who made that? Jaron, Bob, Globusters, who made that shot? I go, I go, it's not, I go, it's not, it's not great. I go, plus it didn't make sense. I go, what is it? And, and a guy wrote me back. He goes, no man, that's a, that's a live link. That's happening. Like right now. I go, I almost developed a facial tech. It's like, what are you talking about? What What's up there right now? It's like, oh, there's a convertible in space. I'm going, no, there's not. And so in, I could break it down in, I don't know, 10 different ways, but I'll give you the, the quick bullet points. Um, because of the vacuum of space, if you believe in space, and the massive temperature dis, uh, differences, you know, between like negative 200 degrees and positive 200 degrees, and the huge swings, that car would be... a a wreck by the time those first photos were even taken. Uh, the windows would have shattered. The side windows would have been obliterated. The front windshield would have been unrecognizable. The dash would have buckled. Uh, every pressurized system in that car would have detonated. Oh, the tires. <laughs> you, you would have had to slash the tires just to make them not turn into bombs. Uh, the battery fluid, the window washer fluid, the brake fluids, uh, all hydraulics, everything would have been just, it would have been a, a soup sandwich. It would have been horrible. Not to mention the little things like, oh, I don't know, it's weird. There's a public company and a private company involved, Tesla and SpaceX. There's not a single logo on that car anywhere. It's like, what are you talking about? This, this is America. You know, you, you, we, that car should have looked like a, like a Daytona 500 racer. That thing should have been wall-to-wall -wall advertisements. In fact, why were you using the convertible in the first place? Why weren't you using your flagship, the S model? Four seats. In fact, you could have sold, I guarantee you, you could have sold the rights to Disney and would have paid for it. You put Boba Fett, Iron Man, Groot, and a Stormtrooper in those four seats. You wouldn't have had to spend a dime on this thing. Sorry. It's just awful. Awful, terrible, <laughs> awful. In fact, I had a guy, I, I was debating a guy just a couple days ago, and he was an attorney. And he even agreed. He goes, oh, yeah, it didn't look real to me. And he, and he goes, but it was good publicity. It was good marketing. I was going, yeah, but you have to tell. So he, he said his point was, yeah, it was probably fake, but it was a good fake. And I was going, yeah, but you have to tell people. You can't just, I mean, there's technically, I suppose there's nothing illegal about, you know, let's say it was fake, right? There's nothing illegal about, you know, saying that, oh, yeah, it's absolutely real. I mean, because you're not selling anything. But come on, you have to tell the public eventually. And sorry. Anyway, go ahead. Well, let me add a, a third challenge to you for ways that you could disprove your theory. Sure. Uh, would if so? I mean, the Air Force flies like U two spy planes at extremely high altitudes. If you get to a certain height, you can start to see the curvature of the Earth. Would you be if they had a, a seat for you in one of those planes? Would you go up? In sure, one of them? absolutely. And by the way, you wouldn't be able to. Neil, De Neil deGrasse Tyson has said on multiple occasions. He goes, no person. Other than an astronaut, U-2, regardless of what's the U-2, SR-71 makes no difference. He said no civilian will ever see the curvature of the Earth, which I thought was interesting. And he said this on multiple speeches on video. He goes, you cannot get high enough. In fact, we've got, here's a perfect example. I can send you half a dozen videos right now uh, from weather balloons at 120,000 feet, which are flat as a freaking board. And yet... When you look at the Red Bull jump, which most of the United States population thinks is absolute gospel, 
when you look at the, the, the Red Bull jump, it's absolutely, it's so unbelievably curved. Remember, they were only 10,000 feet higher, 130,000 feet. And it looks like he's a thousand miles up with the curvature, you know, with the, with the GoPro lens. And it's like, oh, if that, if that was at 130,000 feet, if the curvature was that much, the entire world would be the size of Arizona. So why did every media outlet show that shot? You know, yeah, you can look up on on Google Images and you can see some of the flatter ones. But why did every media outlet use the massive curve shots? Because it's more dramatic. It's better. It sells better. Well, he's. It looks like you're up higher, and that's what it's all about is is selling selling media. So no, U two spy plane. Oh hell, James May uh, from um, Top Gear went up in in the U two spy plane. Don't know why he's always the guinea pig for those things. And uh, you can look, if you, if you slow down the video and go frame by frame, you can tell it's absolutely flat in the background. But the pilots will tell you it's not. So Yeah, I, I know a couple uh, current and former U2 pilots. Um, so, you know, I, as far as my own personal evidence, take their word pretty highly. I've got, um, I've but... got a military list as, as long as your arm of other people that they're on the ground that tell me completely differently, which they say, you know, uh, again, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, they're firing howitzers and tanks and the Sparrow missile system and torpedoes and everything else. They go, the firing solution that we use for all these things way longer than snipers. Remember, snipers only go out to about one mile, uh, you know, 20 miles, 30 miles, 50 miles, and then whatever declassified miles they're talking about he goes the the curvature of the earth and the spinning of the earth are never ever ever factored in ever so why not and that's what everyone says it's like we've heard of the curvature of the earth we've heard of the spin of the earth and not to turn this into a nuts and bolts thing but we've but all of them have said the same thing which is we never factor it into our nine to five jobs why not and it's like it's in fact even the pilots i've talked to they all say the same thing it's like yeah when you're in the front cockpit civilian pilots you know not the military guys you're talking to they say we absolutely see it's perfectly flat but it can't be flat because we're told it's globe so that's where you know it's everything starts to break down um Go ahead. it's well it, it seems like uh i, I think i'm trying to devise a, a like a, a scientific test here we could do and i i like your attaching a camera hypothesis have you tried that with a weather balloon uh, like from sure. ground to air. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we've got the weather balloons will only take you so far, though, because you remember the weather balloons, if you believe in the globe, can only go up. You know, weather balloons not going to go to space, which is a little weird in itself. That's a whole nother argument, which is where is the bleeding edge of space? No one in science will talk about it, which is remember, you have the atmosphere, right? And you have a vacuum. Well, that completely defies thermodynamics, which is pressure needs a container. And they say, and, and science's argument, not, not to get again, get into the nuts and bolts, they say, well, it's gravity. It has to be gravity because we're still alive. I'm going, ah, you're, you're, you're using one to validate the other and saying the only reason we're alive is because gravity is holding down the atmosphere. And that can't, that's the only answer they have. It's like, what, what, because it can't be a pressurized system? What, what I'm saying is we're in a building. We're literally in a pressurized system, a, a, a structure, which means, which would make atmospheric pressure perfectly viable. The vacuum of space isn't viable. But anyway, sorry. As far as the tests go, take your pick. A 4K camera would be great. The, que the question would be, like, for example, uh, because today is the 11th, and I, I have to use the Israeli thing because it's been advertised in a few things. It's weird I haven't seen any, anything today on it, which is, okay, if we have shots like the Chinese, Supposedly have a rover on the moon. It's been there for three years. Where's the time lapse of when they left Earth? Japanese did the JAXA program uh, at least eight years ago. There's no time lapse of them leaving Earth. Uh, same thing with the, the Israelis today. Other programs have done this. No one's done a time lapse of leaving Earth. They can't. It's against the rules. You can't do it. The illusion has to be kept up. See, that, that the international aspect is really interesting to me. Like My general thought on conspiracy theories is that um, a conspiracy, like what, uh, in my mind, what a conspiracy looks like in real life right. is like what the Trump White House looks like, this administration, or what Watergate looks like. Like people leak, people end up like on the inside, end up saying like, oh, that, you know, we were lying about that. Sure. So how, I mean, what we're talking about here would be a global conspiracy because so to speak. each country would be in on it. Yeah. Um, and so just my skeptical nature thinks, Too big. how could no one... It's too big. It's too. It's too big. I know. I and I've heard this argument before, and I try to use it. Uh, let's let's use the micro version of that, uh, which is NASA, which is NASA 
what I'm saying is people say, well, you're talking and I know people say, yeah, every pilot and every scientist. And it's like, no, 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 no. Forget about them. You don't have to worry about them. It's it, but the space agencies. Yes, you do have to take a closer look at it. And what I'm saying is that 99 percent of the people that work for NASA don't know anything. They're just turning wrenches. That's all they're doing. They're building fuel systems. They're polishing capsules. They're doing HR. They they build rockets. I mean, the rockets are real and the rockets get launched and they go off somewhere and get fall in the drink. You know, because there's plenty of ocean to, to lose them in. And people are employed and it's a big, big industry. Only the people that handle telemetry and the people that are above them, the bosses, you do not need that many people to, to keep this thing a secret. A uh, perfect movie example, and I've used this many times, in fact, I use this in the clues, uh, would be the movie Capricorn One, which in itself was fascinating how it was made. I know it's a little older, but you, you probably, it was Yeah, familiar. I haven't seen it. That's okay. If you get a chance, watch it. In fact, I'll tell you the, the origin story of it. The moon landing, most people don't know, is that NASA didn't even give the networks a, a direct feed to the moon landing. They had the networks come to NASA headquarters and film it second generation off their screens. And the networks were very, very upset about this. It's like, why aren't you giving us the freaking feeds? Why are, we, why are we filming stuff with a television camera off a television? That doesn't even make sense. It's like, why, why would you do this? In fact, there was a CBS... Um, affiliate, a station owner that was so angry with the production, he goes, this is terrible. But he, no, not that he didn't believe in the moon landing, but he said the production value was so awful. He goes, I could, he goes, I could make a better moon, moon mission than this, you know, produce it. In fact, I could make a better Mars mission than this. And that's what he did. He made a movie called Capricorn One, but he had a wrinkle to it, which was that the astronauts that the, the t there was going to be a problem and the technology wasn't there and so nasa didn't want to let anybody down so they faked it so they faked the mars mission and during that process nobody in nasa knew except for the telemetry guys that was it because that's all you need well, who cares everybody else you need to know bases there is no better example than this uh all you need is the guys to control the data which is that say, oh, you know, because you want to get off to a certain distance, you're not, you don't have visual range anymore. It's all computer numbers. So all you have to do is simulate those numbers and people believe it. Why not? It's just computer screens. So, don't you think, though, that the Chinese space agency and the Russian space agencies uh, who are in, you know, military terms, our adversaries uh, would want to make the U.S. look bad and prove and release the information that the moon landing was faked at this point in yes, time. Yes, you're absolutely right. However, mutually assured destruction doesn't just work with atomic weapons. This is the only other thing. In fact, this is bigger than atomic weapons, which think of it this way. You're talking about everything's integrated now. China is our biggest trade partner and Russia, even though we're supposed to be enemies, kind of isn't sometimes because we're not we're not even launching out of our airspace anymore. We launch out of Russian airspace. Explain that to me. It's like everyone's there's there's these rivals. And yet when it comes to science, everybody's friends. It's like, all right. All right. That's fine. But as far as, yeah, China, you know, giving up the goods and Russia giving up the goods. The problem is that they wouldn't be just giving up the goods on America. It's everybody. So it's like, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can say, yeah, the United States is faking it. And all of a sudden somebody comes out and yeah, it's because the world is in the shape we we live in. And then all of a sudden it's your problem, too. It's Russia's problem. It's China's problem. And which will circle back to something you eventually ask. It's like, why would anyone care? Why would you keep the secret? If something's like this, why would you bother keeping it a secret? You're smart enough, though. You could probably figure it out, which is there's a potential instability there from a civilization standpoint which is hard to deny uh three prongs uh one would be academic the easiest one which is uh astrophysics and astronomy every university everywhere those close down the remaining physical sciences uh geology hydrology biology archaeology take your pick they uh they have to be rebuilt from the ground up that's every university we're talking about massive amounts of texts which have to be books that have to be destroyed and rebuilt and authors that have to come back in and and do do revisions um economically the world markets would have to be suspended for a while until you figured out what was going on. It would be, I mean, the heck, Donald Trump gets pneumonia tomorrow. The markets are going to respond. That's one guy. Uh, if, it, if the world is not the shape you, you live in, phew, you're talking about huge amounts of instability. But the biggest one would be the religious houses, which, you know, the five, the five big religious houses, um, uh, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. You're giving them all simultaneously leverage over science, potential leverage, and you're asking them to show restraint. Probably not going to happen because all of a sudden you're going to, they're going to say, okay, 
So you were wrong about something really, really big, and you've been beating us over the head with textbooks for the last 500 years. Let's revisit a few things, like, oh, I don't know. And remember, I'm not, I'm not going to do the pro or con religious side, but they're, they, they will ask this. Be like, what about carbon dating? What about the Big Bang Theory? What about evolution? What about dark matter? They, they will not stop. And at that point, you're talking about potential chaos, and men in power d do not take chances when it comes to that. If there's even a 5% chance that the people of this world would run through the, the streets with pitchforks and torches, Frankenstein style. Uh, they're not going to do it. So, sorry. It's my Got it. No, uh, I appreciate it. We're kind of running out of time here. but Okay. Um, uh, no, I, I appreciate the conversation. Um, I think... Uh, hopefully, you know, we, we said at the beginning we weren't going to go to flat Earth. We ended up doing it, but sorry, we modeled. I mean, no, no. Well, let, let's fi let's finish on let's finish on something more more generic, just like conflict resolution. How whatever you want to do. No, I, actually, I, I think this is a, a good place to stop, uh, stop because I think we attempted to demo how people <laughs> who who fundamentally disagree would engage. Um, and I don't know that either of us have moved at all in the debate, but that's I think that's actually as someone who believes in in discourse intrinsically, I think that's an outcome you have to be okay with and actually encourage sure. um, because if you expect someone to change their mind after one debate you're going to probably end up swinging and missing a lot um so yeah i just i just wanted to say thank you oh for yeah your time. You know, hap happy to do it i'm uh, again i i believe by the way you know i looked i look through what you what you do and i absolutely believe in in your uh, in in the challenges you're, you're willing to accept here which is you know can unfortunately we're in a world now and not you you it is your challenge is big no question we live in a very very polarized world and i've seen changes just in the last forget about flat earth for a sec in the last five years i mean it's loud out there i mean there's a lot of people that are, are really dug in on a lot of different positions and i'm sure you know most of them i mean watching the news it, it's it, the, the there's so much more drama in what are the American media that I've, I've never seen before ever, ever. I mean, it seems like it's all condensing, like it's being put in, into a, into a vice. So, but yeah, good, yeah, kudos to you for, for, for taking it head on. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's a uphill battle. <laughs> We're fighting gravity. You could say. Oh, like that. Like that. It's good. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, thanks uh, to all the listeners out there. Uh, Mark, thanks again for your time. Yeah. And uh, we'll call it there, I think. Okay. If you need anything else, uh, feel free to reach out. If you want to talk to anybody else, uh, let me know. I'm I'm pretty much wired in. So. Awesome. All right. Sounds great. All right. Thanks, All man. Right, we'll talk soon. Okay. See ya. Bye-bye.